Hello everybody and welcome to another rousing week in wireless. This week we look at chapters 11 and 12. Alright, so first part of the chapter talks about the processes that an access point goes through when it first starts up. So obviously the first thing that happens is you know you turn it on so power is applied. Then it looks for a wireless LAN controller. So it does discovery, so it tries to find a wireless LAN controller. So during the discovery, uh, the discovery process, it will find one or more wireless LAN controllers. So then the third step is it builds the CAPWAP tunnels um, between one or several wireless LAN controllers, depending on how you have things configured. And those tunnels remain active, even if, it, let's say, it, it establishes a connection with wireless LAN controller one, but it also built a tunnel for two. It doesn't take the tunnel down for number two. And that's more of a failover thing. So if for some reason wireless LAN controller one would die, uh, the tunnel is already built and everything's already established for wireless LAN controller two, so we can kind of like take over effortlessly. All right, so once those tunnels are created, it, it, it joins a wireless LAN controller. So it picks one of the LAN controllers to join. Obviously, some LAN controllers only support so many devices, so one LAN controller may be full, or you may have one set to a specific one for the access point to join, that kind of stuff. All right, so once it joins a wireless LAN controller, it then looks for its image file. Again, which is why they call these lightweight access points, because they don't have all the software on them already. They're going to pull them over from the uh, wireless LAN controller. So once it has the image, then it looks for the configuration file. Uh, it loads that, and then it finally starts to run. Hooray! So as you can see, the wireless LAN controller, obviously, is the central point. It pushes out the images. It pushes out the configurations. So the wireless LAN controller tells the access point what version of software it's using. And then if the access point is using a different version um, than the LAN controller that it joins, it performs a software upgrade or a code upgrade. And the, obviously this will delay the startup process considerably. Now, this is why they tell you, um, you should obviously only update your wireless LAN controllers um, you know, in the evening or off time, because if you update the wireless LAN controller software, it's then going to update all the access points. So the, all the wireless on that controller, are, all those access points are gonna go down and you're gonna lose wireless totally while the LAN controller updates and the access points update. And depending on the size of the, um, the image file that you're pushing out uh, and uh, speed of your network could be you know, several minutes. So, lesson, don't update your wireless LAN controller software until off hours. All right, um, how do I discover a wireless LAN controller? Well, the, the lightweight access point, when it's first turned on, um, sends a unicast CAPWAP discovery request to the controller's IP over UDP port 5246. So make sure you write that down, because it'll probably be a test question, and I'm sure it's on the exam, uh, like for the well, CCNA wireless. If the IP is not known, it sends a broadcast to the local subnet. And then if a wireless controller exists, obviously it sends a response and the IP is then known. So there are a lot of options um, or ways that the, the wireless LAN controller, or I'm sorry, the, the lightweight access point can find a wireless LAN controller. So obviously it can broadcast on the local subnet just like we talked about. Or you can actually hard code the, the wireless LAN controller address in there that we also discussed. Um, but you can also use DHCP option 43 to pull that information over. And if none of those three options work, it then goes to DNS and tries to resolve the name cisco capwap controller whatever your local domain is. So that's the default DNS name for a wireless LAN controller. And if none of those work, the wireless access point um, will reset and then start the whole process over again, over and over and over, um, either until power is turned off or obviously it finds a wireless LAN controller to associate with. All right, so wireless LAN controllers can overload. So obviously each wireless LAN controller can only control a certain number of lightweight access points. The ones that we use in class, the 2106, can only control eight um, access points. Uh, and then after that, when the ninth access point tries to join, it's rejected. Now, you can prime the lightweight access point with a priority value. So let's say you've got a whole bunch of wireless access points, um, but there's a certain eight that you want to access the, the LAN controller, uh, and the other ones are maybe, let's say, you have them as backup. Well, you can prime the lightweight access points with a priority value. So obviously, if you get in the GUI, look for priority value. By default, they're set to low, um, but you can set them for low, medium, or high. 
So you set your eight that you want to actually run on high, um, and you set the backup one on low. So once one of the eight dies, then the low priority would then jump in and, and, and join the wireless LAN controller. Now in a lot of small businesses and stuff like that, where you guys are looking like at the college and at Starbucks, uh, McDonald's, places like that that have these open wireless, uh, wireless isn't really a big thing because uh, they're, they're obviously it's your, uh, as a convenience. But in some um, facilities, you know, wireless is obviously key. If you're in a wireless doctor's office, and there are a lot of those, um, you need to be careful because you know if a, a, a lightweight access point dies, uh, you don't want the uh, you know several doctors to lose wireless and then not be able to perform their duties because obviously they generate revenue. So there are places like that where you'll have redundant lightweight access points in the ceiling ready to go in case one of the you know, uh, primary ones die, the secondary ones can take over. So again, you can set that all up with just um, figuring out its priority value. So remember, by default, all lightweight access points are primed with a low priority. And R2106 will only support eight wireless access points. All right, so the priorities are again are low, medium, high, and critical. The discovery process allows a lightweight access point to maintain the IP address of multiple wireless LAN controllers. So every wireless LAN controller that responds to a lightweight access point uh, when it starts up, it's all recorded inside the configuration or is his settings so that if a primary dies, he knows where else to go. And because like we talked about earlier, it forms the CapWap tunnels to all the controllers by default, um, it would automatically just kind of make the switch and typically the user wouldn't even notice you know, that uh, something died. All right, so what happens when the wireless LAN controller fails? Well, Cisco designs its products with high availability in mind. So the lightweight access point sends a keep alive to the wireless LAN controller every 30 seconds. And obviously you're free to change those settings if you want. So once a keep alive is missed, things escalate and then it, starts, it sends four more keep alives, one every three seconds. So during that time, if the wireless access point, or I'm sorry, or the, the wireless LAN controller or whatever, if it answers, everything goes back to normal. If it doesn't, the wireless access point, I'm sorry, the lightweight access point looks for another controller. So total time is 46 seconds. If a lightweight access point um, can't talk to a wireless LAN controller within 46 seconds, uh, it then looks for, you know, do I have another IP address in my memory? Um, do I have another CapWeb tunnel built that I can start sending to another controller? So it all breaks down to how you look at it. You know, when you compare that to something like EIGRP that, you know, sends things every, every several seconds, and once you miss three, like it'll mark stuff down, that kind of stuff, it's much faster. But obviously with wireless, uh, you can have these uh, 46 second delay, um, and most people wouldn't really bat an eye to that. So typically, a lightweight access point can detect controller failure in roughly 35 seconds. So again, there, they can be primed with primary and secondary controller IPs, and even to, if, if you need to speed up failover time. So again, it all depends on the industry that you work on. A lot of places, or most, the majority of places, wireless is a convenience factor, um, but there are some where it's critical. All right, again, and keep alive times can be adjusted manually if you need faster ones. All right, and also keep in mind that once a lightweight access point links to a controller, it stays with that controller. So even if other controllers pop up and they have, uh, I don't know, higher priority or lower priority, whatever it is, um, the lightweight access point stays with the controller he's currently on unless something happens to make him leave that, like the controller fails. All right, let's talk about redundancy. So there are three redundancies talked about in the book. The first one is N plus one. And N is the number of active wireless LAN controllers and one denotes a backup controller. So let's take a look at that. So here's N plus one. So it doesn't matter how many LAN controllers you have active. So in this case, they have three wireless LAN controllers that are active, and then there's one backup. So N is the number of active, and then one backup. So that if one of these fails, this takes over. So if two fail, you're screwed. You're gonna lose one. All right, and then there's N plus N, and you won't see a whole lot of N plus N. But basically the controllers are paired and then that set is paired with another set. Um, so basically what happens is uh, they're paired in sets and each wireless LAN controller only runs half the load. So the pair will control the full load. So in our case with the 2106s, I would have two wireless LAN controllers and each controller would deal with four access points. 
So it looks like this. So each wireless LAN controller would only deal with four lightweight or the other lightweight access points because its capacity is eight. So it's half of the capacity. And then if one died, the other four could just jump over to another one and then he would be at full capacity. So that's N plus N. There's a primary and a secondary, um, but they both keep half the capacity going. And then if one dies, the other one picks up the other half and then he's at full capacity. All right, and finally, there's a third SSO redundancy. And obviously, you have to have controller software release 7.5 or better to turn this on. And this includes um, client stateful switchover. But the wireless LAN controllers are in pairs with one as active and the other as a standby. All right, and this was the best picture I could find. But basically, you have a wireless, two wireless LAN controllers that work together. One is active and one is standby, So, but it's not handling any clients. He's just like um, a backup for the primary. And then everything is all done like this. So instead of having half the load, half the load, it's I got all the load and I got none of the load and I'm waiting for you to die. So as you can see, this stuff can get very expensive. Even ours, and we have the, obviously the bottom of the line controllers with the 2106. Um, they're about five or 600 bucks a piece. So now every time I need a wireless LAN controller, I have to go buy two of them, which obviously gets expensive. So just to recap, um, N plus one has one backup with the, the wireless LAN controller doing nothing. And that's typically what you see in most places. It's like this almost for everything. So with the wireless LAN controllers, that way I only have to have one backup. Uh, most people have one backup for their switches, one backup for their routers, and that way if a router dies anywhere, we can go take the backup out there, pop the config in there, stick it in, and then order another backup router or a switch or wireless LAN controller or whatever it is. Uh, but it's the, I guess it's the cheapest and easiest method to maintain because you only have to have one extra device for each group of devices. So if I have several wireless LAN controllers, I only need one, one backup wireless LAN controller. If I have several switches, I only need one backup switch, that kind of stuff. The problem with that all comes down to configuration, like your backup switch. Um, you know, with N plus one, you can configure it so that the, the backup controller will take over automatically. But with a switch things like, and, a, and a router, you can't really do that. Uh, it just takes a lot more configuration uh, on the router part, which you can do that. But with a switch, obviously, if a switch dies, you have no idea which switch is going to die. So you got to unplug everything and plug it. So there's there's a there's a period of outage, let's put it that way, uh, that you have to deal with when you run something like this. But most businesses can survive for 10, 15, 20 minutes uh, with a switch going out. So they would rather do this than spend you know tens of thousands of dollars buying all this extra equipment. So N plus N is two controllers sharing the load of one controller, and SSO is each pair has an inactive controller waiting to take over. All right, and that kind of wraps up chapter 11. So chapter 12, roaming. So roaming obviously is moving between access points, and with autonomous access points, the client constantly evaluates the quality of the signal, the quality of the connection. If the signal degrades to a certain point, the client begins looking for an access point with a stronger signal. Now, at what point does the, uh, the wireless client start looking for a new signal? Well, it all depends on the client that you're using. Um, if you get three laptops together from three different manufacturers and you put them on a cart and you start moving them away from the wireless access point, one of them is going to lose the signal before the other two. And one of them is going to keep the signal longer than the other two. So it all depends on the manufacturer. And then the wireless client obviously uses active scanning to find new choices for access points to connect to. All right, so what happens if you're using lightweight access points or uh, a wireless LAN controller? Well, as long as you're roaming between, you know, within a single controller, so I have two access points, one on each end of the hall, uh, and they both connect to the same wireless LAN controller. Well, in that case, it's almost identical to the autonomous access point. But the only difference is the controller handles the process, handles the, the, the let's say, the, the handoff from one access point to another. So you don't have to reassociate, nothing like that. Uh, the controller just makes a change in its database to say, hey, the client is now associated with access point two instead of access point one. And this is called intra-controller roaming, intra-controller roaming. When you're designing these cells, that's what you want. Uh, this is the easiest type of roaming. Um, it's seamless. There, there's no issues with the clients dropping connections or having a delay, things like that. So that's what you want to build into. If you know, if you have a hallway where you got to put four wireless ac or four access points, you know, you want to make sure that those four access points all connect to the same controller. So if somebody's walking down that hall, 
um, and they roam between the access points. It just goes to the controller, and the controller makes the change in this database, and that's the only thing that happens. All right, so if I'm roaming within the single controller, it's called intra controller roaming. If I'm roaming between controllers, it's called inter controller roaming. All right, assuming both controllers are in the same subnet or the same VLAN, the client just has to reassociate with the new controller. So the client hits the new access point that's connected to a new controller, he has to re-authenticate and kind of get back in there. So now he has to re-establish his connection with the new controller. So a couple seconds um, at the most, uh, theoretically, uh, if everything is just right and uh, the gods are with you and whatnot. But if both controllers are in different VLANs, which a lot of times they're going to be, uh, especially if you're connecting between different controllers, um, the client will probably have to pull a new IP address from DHCP, and that's going to delay it even further. So now we can take, um, obviously, you know, 15, 20, even 30 seconds, depending on your network and how everything is configured, um, to reestablish, to pull the IP address, to then reassociate with the new controller, that kind of stuff. But again, the problem is, obviously, all wireless clients are very different. Uh, some have more power, some have different software, different uh, commands, things like that. So some wireless clients are programmed to aggressively contact a DHCP service after a roam. And DHCP can be a long process. Remember, we talked about discover, offer, request, acknowledge. So you want to avoid that. So again, that's why I tell you your cell should be built so that the access points where, where a person would normally walk between a roam should all be on the same controller. But if not, um, the wireless access or the wireless LAN controllers create a tunnel between each other, and working together, they can allow the client to keep its IP address. And again, this is um, this is called a local to foreign roam. So I'm going between controllers. So what happens is, um, you know, let's say I'm in uh, subnet one and I'm moving to a new wireless LAN controller on subnet two. Well, what, what can happen is the local to foreign roam. And what happens is the, the new controller that I talk to, um, he becomes the, the foreign wireless LAN controller. Uh, and he talks back, or I'm sorry, he maybe becomes the anchor. No, I digress. So the new access point becomes the foreign uh, wireless LAN controller. And then he talks back to the original wireless LAN controller to get information. So basically, he really kind of becomes a pass-through for the original wireless LAN controller. So let me show you a picture of this that will kind of help you figure it out. So here I am. I'm a client, and I'm established here on this uh, wireless LAN controller 1. And I'm on VLAN 10 or VLAN X, however you want to say it. So as I roam over here, as long as you have mobility 7.0 and up, um, on your wireless LAN controllers, what will happen is what they call the foreign, the, the foreign to local room. So as I come over here, I'll talk to this guy and he'll make a tunnel between this other wireless LAN controller that I have previously made my association with and then this guy will be the anchor controller and the new one becomes the foreign controller. And then this guy will still control me and so I don't have to change my IP address. Then he'll just pass everything through his tunnel to wireless LAN controller 2 who will then pass it through the CAPWAP tunnel um, back to the client. So the client never has to pull an IP address from DHCP. All right, now think about this for a minute though. Um, this, obviously this is works and you can do this uh, and sometimes this is your only solution. And it's a nice feature, but these diagrams show it like this, like, oh, like these two guys just make a tunnel between each other. Well, that's not necessarily the case. This guy then probably talks to a switch over here in VLAN Z, which then connects to the router, which then connects to another switch over here, which then connects to this VLAN. So every time this guy wants to do something, wants to send a frame or get a frame, it's got to go <laughs> to here. And then he's got to send the information back, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So obviously, if you have too much of that going on, it's going to have a detrimental effect on the performance of your network. But on the plus side, it is cool as crap that Cisco allows you to do stuff like that. All right, then your book talks about, you can actually see this, like if you go to the, the wireless LAN controller in the protocol section, um, you would sit over here where it says protocol. Instead of 802.11b, you see 802.11 uh, mobile, and that's when you know that somebody obviously is using this mobility group feature, um, and they're uh, they're on one access point, but they're in the v or the subnet or VLAN of another access point. And again, you can see a picture of this on the bottom of page 294 in your book. All right, so again, if I hit monitor, I can see stuff like the the access point address um, that I'm connected to, my mobility role, uh, whether it's local, foreign, that kind of stuff. 
um, and then my access point type, you know, and my 802.11a, bc, that kind of stuff. All right, so mobility groups. Controllers can be put into groups to facilitate inner controller roaming. So roaming inside a mobility group is almost seamless and very fast. So again, if we're dealing with large areas, we want to put the controllers in these mobility groups so that they'll do the stuff. So roaming between mobility groups is terribly inefficient. Credentials are not cached, so clients have to go through the full authentication process, probably have to ask for DHCP information. Uh, it's just a nightmare. So if, for some reason, uh, there are places where your clients are going to roam, where they're going to have to go between uh, two different controllers, you want to create a mobility group between those controllers. But if you can help it, obviously you want to try to put all the access points on the same controller. You know, there's not a whole lot of reasons why, especially with, with eight wireless access points on one controller, that somebody should roam between nine access points. That's just amazing. Um, but, and I can't even think of a place where you would have that, but I digress. So with mobility groups, they, again, they cache information, and as long as you're in the same mobility group, um, clients can kind of roam between them, and these guys all cache each other's information in the same group, so it's a lot easier to, you know, make the switch between controller. Um, it's when you go between mobility groups or between controllers that are not in a mobility group that you have to start going through all these processes again. All right, that about wraps us up. So this week, I think you actually set up the wireless LAN controllers, woohoo, uh, and get to play with those, build a config, save it to your desktop, that kind of stuff. So again, if you have any questions, make sure you bring them up in class. Other than that, have a good one.